Hello and welcome to the 2020 National Signing Day edition of Inside the Borough. My name is Dan. I am joined uh, by Jack and Shane as usual. And tonight we are going to uh, not necessarily break down every single player, but we're going to give a, a good overview of what went down in FAU's uh, 2020 signing class. And um, so I guess the, uh, to, to get started, this was a, another – uh, another really good class. I think uh, Shane and Jack will, will dig a little bit deeper into um, into some of the players. Uh, and we also got some questions. So thank you guys on Twitter that responded. We'll go through some of those. Um, but, you know, it seems like another, another top quality class, depending on the rankings. Um, you know, I don't think FAU statistic, or statistically maybe they had the highest class, um, but not in rank. They wise. technically just jumped to number one depending on who's officially we can get into like yeah who's officially come yet but it, it's yes it's argued they just jumped to 247's top class in the conference um but we got to get that kid on campus so yeah that, that um, that's a major like, thing to to remember that this is you know there's a lot to be excited about with um with signing day and things like that, but remember that there's there's players that we can be excited about on signing day and have been excited about on signing day that never make it to campus um, or never make it, uh, you know, to the top of the depth chart, which is... No, which is I, I will just preempt that before we get started thinking this is not like last year's class or it's a ton of kids and we're sitting here with the list of names. Now, every signing class across from the country will have one or two kids that something comes up they don't you know they don't make it or they get delayed um it's been you know put out there that you know maybe there's a couple different great you know shirts options with these classes not all that's clear yet um so you know i i just want to focus on the kids themselves um and you know what kids we can kind of be looking forward to because they're going to be here for four years you know we're not going to worry about whether they enrolled in uh summer a summer b fall or you know winter semester when they're playing here two years from now contributing games so let's just you know kind of focus on the positive of that um so i guess shane go, i mean go ahead and you're, you're certainly the um you know the the lead you cover recruiting the most for for the owl's nest and really for for fau overall what's your um you know your kind of general summation of this year's class right so, now uh, two things, you know, the the first thought is it kind of going back to the early signing period and just you know, the difficulty for um, Willie Taggart to, and his whole staff, with, with how many kids come off the board, more and more you see. I think it, it didn't jump up this year. The first three years of the early signing period, you saw more and more. I think this is the first year that it kind of stayed the same or there's a few percentage points less. But nonetheless – 75% of the kids in the country are off the board that day. Uh, you know, it, it, so it's tough, especially like at positions like quarterback and O-line and stuff. Um, you know, but Willie said on that early signing period day, you know, uh, someone asked about a, uh, you know, what is it like to kind of have a finally a stable quarterback? You know, and Chris Robinson, you know, who's here for the next two years. And, you know, he immediately came back and said, we got to get him guys to throw the ball to. Obviously, we're losing Harrison Bryant. And, you know, outside receiver last year was still kind of an inconsistent positions um, for FAU. And they went and added, you know, th four transfer receivers, three being from the ACC, two of them grad transfers. Aaron Young, long, experienced, um, you know, big kid out of Duke, uh, you know, had over 30 catches last year. Uh, you know, I, you know, I found out tonight he was, uh, art his like, uh, like really smart kid at Duke was like majored in art, you know, tons of art histories here coming for the sports management program, which is a big theme for FAU and their grad transfers. That sports management program is a huge recruiting tool, um, for the grad transfer market for FAU. Um, and TJ Chase coming from Clemson, you know, okay, you, four-star kid coming out of high school he's still that kid with all that ability at Clemson you know, you know you get behind a couple of two of the best receivers in the country um and Higgins and um Scott there but 
you know, they added guys that can play immediately. You know, this is also um, DeMarcus Adams coming from Florida State, who he still needs a waiver. You never know what the NCAA is going to do waiver-wise. Um, but, you know, so that could just be another option we add. You know, that's, that's three potential receivers to go along with John Mitchell and Willie Wright who are already coming back in a loaded backfield. Um, the other kind of big point with this class is trenches. I mean, I think um, if you include kind of the stand-up outside linebacker types who'll be rushing the passer, I think it was like 12 or 13 total players who you can consider kind of quote-unquote, you know, inside-the-box trench type players. Uh, you know, we see all around G5 football how hard it is to stop the run and find those type of players, and FAU went – Alabama, Georgia, to get some big kids, um, you know, to win those battles because, you know, everyone likes to make the comparison. You know, we did it all this season with the twenty seventeen class uh, with the FE, the twenty seventeen FEU football team. That team was great in putting up eight had eight hundred yard games because it had one of the best off offensive lines in school history. We added some of those kids today, like Andre Lamas and. Uh, Malik Jones and um, Alex Savage. So um, it, it, it was a really good class. I mean, player for player, it's one of the best classes we've ever had. If so, not the best. Yeah, I, I agree with you, Shane. Um, and you mentioned earlier that right now, um, as we're recording this late Wednesday night, FAU has jumped everyone on top of the conference rankings, according to 24-7, uh, British recruiting class. That's going to be, what, at least the, the fourth straight year that FAU's had number one, at least when it comes to average composite scores or number one outright in the conference. Uh, it's really cool to see that, you know, our program is starting to become consistently good at recruiting. And you got to think back then, three, four years ago, we didn't have the facilities that we have now where we can compete against the UCFs and even some of the, the big three uh, inside the state of Florida. Uh, real quick. You, you talked about uh, – I want to bring two things up. We, we talked about at the beginning of this season about our biggest concerns. And I, I think we kind of agreed that wide receiver was one of our biggest concerns going into this year. Uh, we then talked about early signing day, our biggest concerns. And it was still wide receiver. And also, like you just mentioned, Shane, talking about the guys in the trenches, the offense and defensive line. That early signing day, we took care of, of some of those requirements that we needed to fill at the line and at wide receiver. And, and today, we just completely reloaded. Uh, those transfers you mentioned are huge. TJ coming over from Clemson, four-star, massive. Uh, but then we also got some much-needed depth. Uh, Willie Wright Jr. at quarterback. Uh, 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 oh, oh, Joe Lewis, that linebacker, remember he was gray shirted. Uh, he was part of the, he's supposed to be part of the class last year, gray shirted out of Tampa Bay Tech High School. He's going to be helping us out. Uh, Lou Dorsey, tight end, third or second ranked Juco tight end in the country. Uh, once enrolled at uh, University of Illinois. Um, just, just massive, massive injection of depth uh, that we now have into the program. Uh, definitely one the of the offense is going to have a lot of weapons next year. So many... I mean, this is if they get all these guys going and playing, it's my god, it's and we're going to be you... talking about some of the questions that we had. Uh, and some of the questions was about you know, Chris, uh, with some of these wide receivers. I know Dan has the, the list of questions in front of him. I can't wait to start talking about what Chris is going to be doing with these receivers, uh, because it's going to be. It's going to be unreal what we're going to be able to do to conference USA pass defenses. Could be. I mean, I mean, uh, again, think of wide receiver, but also um, we're still stacked at running back as of right now with uh, BJ Emmons, uh, Larry McCann, and, and um, Malcolm Davidson. Like, it could be a, a, a historic it, offense next it, year. We didn't do a – we didn't really do um... – we didn't have the podcast after early signing period. And um, I want to point out, you know, there was a lot, they didn't take a running back this cycle because there was just kind of an imbalance of scholarships there. And 
I know Frank Gore Jr. is an exciting player, but you also got to remember the three running backs we just mentioned all have two or more years left. And then you had Kelvin Dean, who was a highly recruited kid last year, who we saw a little bit of uh, redshirted. I mean, this is, Kelvin Dean's a kid who was coming out of the fall camp who was going to see serious playing time. And then uh, Glover Cook, who is a highly rated kid, you know, and then you still have like two more years of Tyreek Tisdale, who's a running back, who's, you know, a great, one of our best special teamers. Um, so that position was just kind of loaded. They just didn't need to take a running back this cycle. Um, you know, they just had much other needs. You only have so many scholarships. Um, and that's kind of what we're seeing. If you didn't announce everybody that, we, you know, we had on the nest, um, you know, we said signed, you know, there is kind of, so, it's really complicated. It's almost like doing your taxes kind of stuff um, with scholarships and how to, you know, what kind of things you can use to move one kid to count against next year and that type of stuff. But, you know, like I said, you know, the, these kids will eventually all be here in the coming months. And, uh, you know, what, what, like there's a lot and just another year of talent injection into FAU. It's just kind of building on it you know um we gotta I, I want to point out uh that we gotta Dan put out we what we got a lot of questions today so I, I don't want to I kind of want to save some of the stuff um for all your guys's questions yeah we we definitely got a ton and so if there's you know I, I think that there, there, we'll probably have to to wrap up you know or tie some things uh tie some things together later on but um, I think that one of the first questions we got was regarding the, the defensive line. And this comes from Chris uh, at Gucci. Uh, thanks for the question. Uh, what is the D-line going to look like with the majority of last year's players graduating? Good question. I mean, defensive line, especially as the year went on, started to become a, a, a real strength for us. Um, so, um, yeah, that's certainly. It's, that. Well, let's just start. We're going to FAU switching to kind of, if you watch Jim Levitt football, as long as I have, going back to his USF days and following them, you know they run a 3-4. So we're kind of changing our scheme. We're going to kind of see that traditional 3-4. The three down linemen, and you kind of have your two stand-up outside linebackers, uh, kind of, pat, you know, one's a pass rusher, two kind of true uh, middle linebackers. Um, you know, right now, uh, your best defensive lineman coming back uh, in the middle is Jalen Joyner. Uh, you certainly, you know, you have Colin Dell there. Uh, and Joyner was, got hurt kind of at the end of last year, so it was a little tough. Um, didn't get a year of development. This this class has to produce a couple of kids that play early on this D-line, which is a tough ask. Um, Alvin Dempsey, the Juco kid, will definitely play early. He'll definitely be kind of in that factor. But, you know, one of the – things when I say kids have to play early is one of the advantages we had we had to, we had about six kids especially um in the D tackle position we could rotate you know uh, it was the Will Davises the Ray Ellis's the Kevin McCrary's the Noah Jefferson's Colin Dell you know keeping those bodies fresh so we're stopping the ball run in the fourth quarter um uh, one kid I, I think you could see immediately um, getting into a rotation is Evan Anderson, the defensive lineman from Jones High School. I mean, this kid is big, huge, he's strong. And when you run the 3 4, you need that kind of traditional zero. They, you know, plays the zero, lines up over the center, plays two gaps. You know, uh, he's a nose tackle and he's got fast hands. They were, you know, talking about him today. The kid also plays lacrosse, so he's athletic. If you go watch his huddle video, he's a lot faster. Really, not to use a kind of a cliche uh, football term, but he's really quick in a box, you know. Um, <laughs> so that's a kid I, I would look for just because he kind of almost seems like he could fit that role. He could also play some three technique in high school, but – he can really fit that role. So I'm curious to see if maybe he starts to, you know, after maybe the first few weeks, especially getting the conference play, we start seeing him get more reps throughout the game on that defensive line. Other than that, Leigh McCarthy, you're going to see stand up and uh, you're going to maybe see some of the young kids 
just kind of uh, develop. Uh, Chris Jones, who we got today, was a big signee. That's that's Huge. a kid who they're going to put some weight on, and he's going to be an animal for us. So, Yeah. I, I think when it comes to the line, I'm right with you. Uh, Chris Jones uh, and Evan Anderson from Jones High School in Orlando. Uh, I'm really curious if we kept the four down linemen, if we would have seen uh, Malik Jones flirt with – being a defensive lineman, just, you know, hypothetical, because he had a lot of tackles for Zephyr Hills Christian Academy, a very small school in the Bay Area. Uh, but didn't he really was O-line all the way. But so. I, I feel like because we are so depleted at, at O-line, and now we're going to be going to, to one less down uh, lineman on defense, we're really not going to need him there. Uh, but with how young this defensive line is going to be, uh, I, I, I would have been curious to see what would have that – what that situation would have looked like if we still had four down linemen. You know, I, I don't think the O-line is as depleted as – let's remember, we're, we're going to bring some solid starters back. Um, you know, Desmond Noel played, you know, really well last year at the rate guard position. Um, I, I, I think, you know, Marquise Robinson kind of improved throughout the year at right tackle, okay, I think bringing Jeff Nord back is huge. You saw that offensive line get better. You know, we talked about the Western Kentucky game was kind of like the the offensive line kind of stepped into a new level for FAU. Yes, you lose Brandon Walton and um, Diaz in the middle, who are conference players. Center, it could take a while to figure out, but you know, we brought in enough talent. Eli Fields, um, Sebastian Dolce was a mistake commit. They just got him to come down here just to take a visit, and they're like, he was. Kids are blown away what FAU has on campus. And then next thing you know, he's like, well, I'm from Miramar. Let's let's just stay here. This has everything an SAC school has to offer now. Um, he's going to get in that mix immediately at left and right tackle position. Um, Alex um, X. Savage is a kid you could – one of the freshmen I keep hearing his name immediately could, could compete for – a numerous positions on the O line. So from IMG, so you know he's yes. the best. Yeah. So offensive lineman. I think they've brought in enough talent and they recruited the position well last year. You know, I think sometimes we forget about like the kids who rest shirt, Deshaun Richardson, uh, you know, Federico Mangus, uh, Tolliver. So there's a there's a lot of kids, there's a lot of competition on the O line. And when you have a lot of competition, the cream kind of rises to the top and we'll have a good solid O line. Dan, you got the next question? Yeah. Uh, this one comes from uh, Mark Lee. Mark Lee, um, who's always uh, uh, a good follow if you don't follow him. Uh, I, he, he's got a bunch of questions, but I think uh, to one of the, the things that we can kind of break down is um, that all of our positions of need uh, get met with this class. And if you listen to Willie Taggart uh, and probably most coaches, that, you know, they're going to give you the standard coach speak of, yeah, you know, we had a lot of me, we, we, we had a lot of needs and we met all of those. And um, so I, I don't know, I, I think it's uh, breaking down the class uh, a little bit more. Obviously, FAU had some needs with defensive line and we really kind of went over that. Um, I guess what, what would be what would be the next need after defensive line? We, you know, we didn't mention uh, running back. Uh, we, we went over that tight end, got a little bit of help there. Um, kind of at the end of the day, but, you know, outside of defensive line, what do you guys think is the, was the next need uh, for FAU moving into 2020? And did we need that? Need? Uh, I, I think a need kind of going forward and I don't know if we've met it, you know, that we, there's only a couple DBs in this class and we'll see where they play um, is outside corner, which is a little different. FAU's done a great job recruiting kind of the safeties, the, you know, the, the hybrid, you know, nickels and stuff. We'll see. Um, outside corner, you know, Miko Dotson's still in the portal. Who knows where he ends up? Um, hasn't gone anywhere yet. James Pierre went to the NFL early, which well-deserved. The kid's going to end up being a nice – his draft stock's going to blow up a little bit. So – a uh, little worried about there. Um, I don't know what FAU has scholarship wise, but you know there could be an addition in the summer. Uh, kind of just a uh, lanky, tall outside corner. You know, we'll we'll kind of see where that falls. Uh, but you know, they added Peter Work Jr. plays defensive backs. 
um, and Trevor Reeves, who yeah. is I, I, I some people say you know he he can play corner, um, but man, you watch his tape; it's it's safety, and he's a hard hitter, and he can play in the box. So, but he has all the length and size. That's why I think it's intriguing with him. He's a, he's a really long kid, which makes it intriguing for him to play corner, but you put on the tape and you see how hard hitter he is and how good he is at filling gaps. It's like, well, okay, <laughs> let's play him at safety. So um, definitely, ver he's definitely a versatile kid there. I, I agree. Um, athletic defensive back will be, will be a need next. And then here comes the spicy takes boys uh, quarterback after this year. I, I think we should start really think, we should start thinking about who the next program quarterback is going to be and have a general idea once Chris goes into his senior year. Uh, obviously, oh, it's Javion Posey. Oh, I this, think so. this is going to be so spicy. That, that's oh. my spicy take. So he played receiver last year, and he caught yep. the last offensive class of the FAU season at receiver. But, man, if you follow FAU's strength coach on Instagram and Twitter and you see those numbers, and, and I remember seeing a – uh, one of the scrimmages at fall camp where he, he, you know, he was going against a third string, but, you know, as just a true freshman, he was making some accurate throws. And you see his athletic ability. And, yes, he would probably, if they decide to leave him at receiver, okay, he could probably be developed into a nice receiver in a couple of years. But I saw those throws, and I see that athletic ability. And he'll get a red shirt from last year. I don't think he played fully in four games. Um he would be a redshirt junior by the time Chris leaves. He'll have two full years, and I want to see him. You know, Willie Taggart's the head coach with his size and athletic ability. I'm just going to say we'll go full hot take. He could be our Quentin Flowers. I was just about to say I'm, I'm talking probably faster. Maybe Quentin's a little bigger, but yeah. Posey is, like, maybe even more athletic. So that would be insane to think about. Yeah, so I, I think that's – that kid blew it off. I don't know also what they're going to do at Cortland Littlejohn. He moved to receiver. Yeah. They like him there. Um, I mean, let's remember, Willie Tiger Jr. took his team to – played at four different high schools, and he took his – I think three or four. I, I'm not 100% correct on that, just because he's moving around with his dad. And it's – he took a team to a state title. Yeah. Um, you know, it was that, he definitely has time to kind of grow. He's a, he's a real long kid. He's tied, definitely time. They're going to get him in the weight room and put – um, you know, put weight on him, and, you know, he doesn't have to play immediately. So they have time. Chris has two more years to develop these kids and figure out what they want to do behind them. So That's very important, Shane, that you said that Chris has time to help develop these, uh, these players, these kids, because that's something that Willie Taggart said in the presser uh, Wednesday evening. Um, and he, Coach Taggart was specifically talking about his son, uh, about how he – about how Coach Taggart is excited – that his son could learn from such a great quarterback like Chris. Um, yeah, Cordell Littlejohn will be interesting. Posey will be interesting. Willie Tiger Jr. will be interesting. Uh, Jalen Warsham is a guy we picked up late today who played quarterback for Wakula uh, High School. He was the 5A player of the year in the state of Florida. Uh, I'm not sure exactly where he's going to play. Shane, you might know. I'm not even sure if FAU knows right now, but that's just one of those situations where you just have an athlete uh, and you just bring him in no matter what. And I feel like when a place like Wakula, I hope I'm even saying that correctly. Well, uh, thank you. Uh, he, he's the quarterback because he's the most athletic player on the field. Uh, so who knows where, where he ends up being? Yeah, he's going to probably play corner. He's going to play corner. So, so he's athletic, like we're talking about. So that helps yeah. that DB spot, which then goes to show that quarterback could be an issue in the future. Florida is the one state, and you talk about this, and this is, you know, at all the camps I go to, where the best players on the field, the most athletic kids, no other states like this. This is me defending Florida high school football. The best, most athletic kids play defense. No, no other – so many other kids, oh, we got this super tall, fast, athletic kid. Okay, go to receiver. In Florida, it's like defense. It, you know, it's – that's why, you know, you see so many great DBs and linebackers come out of this state. So, a little, little pride there, you know. Um, and they all drip of swagger every single yeah. one. So, 
FAU will be able to find, you know, more defensive backs cutting on in future classes. And we've recruited well there. So it's not like, you know, let's remember Roman Mungin and is, is probably, you know, Smoke um, could play outside corner this year. Tasia Young. Um, it wouldn't even be seen Zion Gilbert is athletic enough to play corner. We have kind of a, a lot of kids who can play safety. So, you know, don't be surprised if you see him move there. Deshaun Moss has been around for a while. So, you know, I, I will say this in just kind of, we haven't talked to our fans in a while. Jim Levitt, who is the higher defense coordinator, I don't think has ever been part of a bad defense. No. I mean, he made Colorado good for a year. And if you can make Colorado's defense look good for a year, you can make a lot of places look (laughs) good. That defense he had was nuts, too, at Colorado. Yeah, which is – if you look at at Colorado's defensive numbers this year. (laughs) You know, think of, uh, again, his his longest tenured um, college uh, head coach. I mean, he he turned USF into – uh, a consistent, oh, I wouldn't say powerhouse, but turned um, USF into a competitive football program, and they had a lot. They had a lot of really good wins. Beat uh, Auburn, uh, um, West Virginia, Kansas. West Virginia, Kansas they was good. They Florida had Todd State, I believe as well. They beat Florida Who? State. Yeah, they beat yeah. Florida State in two thousand. Oh, yeah. and, uh, and they beat my. Uh, they beat Miami yeah. too. They beat yeah. Miami. They beat Florida State. They almost beat UF. They beat Notre Dame. Uh, they beat Kansas when Kansas was like a top 10 team. Yeah, that's – that was all just – Yeah, the point is that, that you know, that as far as – I think there, there may be some um, uh, some questions about, you know, how the, how the team's going to – how the new coaches are going to kind of take over a, a winning team. And I think, um, you know, you, I, you – I don't think you could ask for, you know, so, some better experience, certainly – um, at the defensive coordinator. and on This the is a really good staff. I mean, just look at the safeties coach that was hired, Lance Gidrick. I mean, he was just – he has a winning record at McNeese State. He actually beat – I was pointed out to me um, – he beat Willie Taggart in the game. I don't know if they remember Mc, McNeese State crushed USF early on. Yep. Uh, if you remember that game, I mean, this was like – we're going back like seven years. I think Willie Taggart, maybe first year at USF after Skip Holtz left and USF was kind of um, – he was still just building. Yeah, he it was before Willie got a chance to build the program there, um, and he beat it. So he had a winning record there. And I'm a, always a big fan when you have lots of guys with head coaching experience on a coaching staff. Because one thing that's kind of been told to me it's 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 a different ball. You know, when you kind of you're a position coach and you have this whole thing of understanding you know how to run the whole program and game planning and stuff and the more experience you can kind of bring to that and you know more guys thinking about time management and games and stuff it all the better um i mean this staff i've seen some people say um this this staff willie's put together is maybe one of the better ones he's ever had so you know kevin patrick uh you know uh a lot of UM fans wanted so, um, and and obviously we we got fortunate enough to keep Clint Trickett, who is we know the amazing job he's done a down rising. here. So. Absolutely, lucky to hold on to him. Yeah. Um, so, so what we, else do we got, Dan? Keep firing away. <laughs> uh, yeah, there's. Uh, I'm I'm going through trying to find the ones that are kind of most uh, applicable. Uh, to, to this year's class. This, this was kind of a, a, a hybrid question that we got. Um, how do you think Chris is going to handle, and, and we kind of mentioned this earlier, but how do you think Chris is going to handle losing Harrison Bryant and who potentially uh, could we have to uh, come in and fill that space? I know we, we had a, a tight end signing, but um, just kind of get that thought, that thoughts out there. Losing a thousand yard receiver, um, Mackey award winner. What do you guys think about the, uh, the tight end position or the, the, transformation of the tight end position in the offense I, I think one thing that a lot of people aren't thinking about in regards to Chris is he's going to get a full year and a full spring right yeah I mean, we have not he was suspended all last spring and put together the season he had and he, I think he was suspended part of the spring before that right yeah uh, kind of, yeah, yeah. Going into the 2018 year, there was like a 
suspension at the beginning. So him kind of just having a full year, yep. which we haven't seen before and without any, you know, he's so far has been kind of just since the issues last spring has been nothing but a model citizen um, yeah. for everything we know. So just kind of him having a full summer, I think he's just really going to take off this year. And, and just look at all the, the receivers he's going to have around him. Yeah, you know, we're going to miss Harrison Bryant. But remember, Harrison Bryant didn't have a touchdown until two-thirds of the way of the season because John Rain was, was used so well. It's partially because uh, defenses were trying to hone in on, on mm -hmm. Harrison Bryant. And when we used a two-tight end set, that gave John Rain some open looks. Uh, but it showed that he's more than capable – of picking up where our Mackey Award winner uh, has left off. So I think what this means, that Chris is finally going to have a full spring. Uh, he's going to build chemistry with this new wide receiver core uh, and this, I would even say, improved tight end depth, uh, especially with Lou Dorsey in, uh, Raymond Smith. Um, the list can go on. That he is going to compete – Oh, here comes another big one. He's going to compete not just for being one of the top quarterbacks in all of the group of five, but being a top quarterback in the nation. I think we saw glimpses of it this year, uh, 2019. But I, I think this is going to be a year where we really start to think that he's going to become the greatest quarterback in program history. We're going to be saying, Rusty Smith, who? Um, uh -huh. Uh, just to get – just – go, Dad. I, I would um, – yeah, I, I think uh, what, what we saw this past year, um, where I think when he starts, you know, I think reaching his potential. Again, he was, you know, one of the best, uh, you know, the elite 11 quarterbacks um, uh, coming out of high school and stuff like that. So I certainly don't think that he's peaked yet. And when he starts to, to even – uh, use his skill even more and throwing receivers uh, more open. And, you know, just think of like, I, there were so many times last year that I would see him just kind of, you know, throw the ball off his back foot, not get his feet set and, and, you know, trust his arm. Uh, you know, if he starts, um, you know, doing things more uh, mechanically sound and, uh, you know, and, and kind of really digs into what he's capable of. Yeah. He certainly, he's got all the potential to, to be one of the best quarterbacks. Um, in Conference USA history, especially with, you know, weapons surrounding him. Well, going full cocky FAU fan, I think the biggest thing that's going to hold uh, Chris back is him just not playing in fourth quarters because we're going to be up so much. <laughs> so that's sure. it. <laughs> yeah, so – or just, you know, we, between our – with our running backs, you know, they might just do a game and say, hey, can we see if we can win today without throwing the ball? And it'd right, be yeah. entirely possible with our running back. So, no, <laughs> we're having fun with it. But, yes, that is the type of talent um, FAU has, and they've kind of added to this class. Uh, any, any last questions? Well, I just want to say real, real quick, that, that was a question that was posed by FAU season, by the way, and that's the one I was most excited for. Um, and speaking of let's be jerks, has anyone noticed that uh, Marshall is 11th in Conference USA recruiting. <laughs> yeah, good old Doc Holiday. Doc Holiday, man. man. <laughs> All right, uh, so next, I had to. I'm sorry, guys. It's not about stars. Um, <laughs> anyway, uh, so we can kind of wrap up. I, I thought this was, was, was a fun question, um, and it was uh, which son of a former player do you think will have the biggest impact? So which of the fun the, – which of the – a former NFL player. So to think right now on the roster, anyway, you've got uh, Terrell Owens has a son that's on FAU. Um, I'm trying to think of the uh, two other ones. Uh, Warren Sapp, uh, the second. Who, who, there, there's a third one, isn't there? It Rashawn was. Lewis. Yes. Um, uh, yeah, Ray Lewis's Ray Lewis's kid, and then I think the fourth one was going to be Frank Gore, obviously, but that's uh, that didn't. Uh, happen. Je no, Jeff James, Jeff James, he's still there. Jeff James. Yes. Okay. Um, so I I thought that was kind of a, a a fun question of you know who do you guys think would be the uh, um, who do you guys think would be be the best uh, that we could be seeing of former NFL players and. 
former Hall of Famers, really, or current Hall of Famers. Uh, yeah, well, I mean, you, you then you're also going to have Willie Taggart Jr., uh, even though, you know, Willie Taggart didn't play in the NFL, but then also, um, oh, God, guys, the one, the Peter Wark Jr. as well, and Shane, you mentioned him. Uh, I'm most excited for Peter Wark Jr. Uh, because he's the one out of them all that's going to be on scholarship. Uh, I, I, Jeff James, yeah. I think is going to play a lot this year that I think they, though they're going to find a way he was, he was listed on the depth chart a number two, a lot last year, um, played a lot on special teams. Um, so uh, I think you're going to start seeing him more out there. Only a red shirt junior. So, um, you know, he was at, he was at UM, um, at one point. So Jeff James would be, uh, Peter Warwick Jr. I think will develop into a nice player. I think kind of in the, I don't know if I don't know exactly where they're going to play him in the secondary, but you know FAU still has a lot of talent in the secondary, so it's kind of a more a little bit more of a difficult position to crack early for FAU just because I mean, we're bringing back guy Amon Ross, yeah. uh, you know R- Roman Munch and Tasia Young, all those guys are coming back, so. Um, you know, it, it's a little bit tougher position to crack, but uh, Jeff James, my pick there. Um, I do want to say Peter Warwick Sr. was like my favorite player ever in the entire world growing up. That was like my prime young uh, eight year old me watching those like late year Florida State teams and watching Peter Warwick just run around the world. Nuts. <laughs> Yeah, he's probably one of my co- favorite college football. This is he was before Re- he was Reggie Bush before Reggie Bush was Reggie Bush. Okay, <laughs> it was Peter yeah. Warwick. So, um, I, I that, think, that was a fun question. Fin- go ahead and finish your thoughts, Eric. Sorry. Yeah, I'm sorry. I, I think if we didn't do such a good job at receiver, I think it would have been interesting to see what Owens would have done because he's he's a pretty big, lanky looking dude. Um, I've I've seen him warm up plenty of times, and you can tell that he has the size of a. He's a lot of speed too. Yeah, so I, I think it would have been interesting, but I mean, we're talking about all these receivers. We haven't even mentioned uh, Jamarquise Johnson, who's what like our top three, top four recruit in this class. Um, he he could even play right away because he has the size to do it. So it. <laughs> I, so I, I guess it would have to be Peter Wark Jr. by default because he's the one that's going to uh, might see action or like you were saying, Jeff, as well. Um, all right. Well, we, uh, we appreciate the questions and uh, we'll try to incorporate that uh, a little bit more moving forward. So definitely make sure you check out uh, FAUallisness.com for all of the the latest and ongoing things and a uh, big shout out to Shane who, who really did an awesome job this year covering. Uh, I, I want to thank the, everyone that supported me on the nest, the fans working hard, working harder to get even better and bring more for the 2021 class, spending more of my time. So it's tough to kind of juggling a couple jobs doing it, but I love doing it. It's a passion of mine. Um, but I couldn't do it without like the support you guys Uh, give to me on Twitter and uh, always on the forum. And thank you, Jack and Rick, who you guys never see kind of, I'm out there grab trying to grab the information and stuff. And they're kind of, they're the team kind of helped me put it, you know, all together with the images and we work as a team doing this. I mean, it takes, it takes three people and not, it's not easy with three people. I mean, Jack and I, it's, it's with three people. It is still like, we need two more people helping with this. Yeah. So, <laughs> with full, you know, three people with full-time jobs, Ryan as well was at the presser. Yeah. For, um, and you know, he's been helping us out with basketball and he's a, he's a student. He's, he has a job. I'm back in school. I have a job, Shane, you know, it's, I don't know how we do it, but if, if it wasn't for our awesome fans and our love for FAU, then we wouldn't. So, I mean, thanks yeah, to all of y'all. For, so. Yeah. Keep giving us uh, the passion to keep doing it. Yeah. So again, we, we appreciate you guys and uh, we'll, we'll probably have uh, a couple episodes here coming out uh, more in the springtime and, and some spotty episodes. We didn't really get a chance to uh, talk about the Schmidt center uh, as much It's not, I don't think it's officially open paint hasn't gone on and stuff like that. So uh, we'll, we'll give an update on the Schmidt center as um, uh, probably closer as we get to uh, 
uh, spring ball. So keep an eye out for that and, you know, make sure you're following all of us on Twitter and, um, you know, at inside the borough and check everything out at uh, fuelsnest.com. So uh, once again, we really appreciate you. Um, and for Jack and Shane, we will see you next time. Go Owls.